Mendoza? Yeah, I'd like to I'd like to move to advise, <laughs> amend the agenda to include at the very first item to have an update on the tax assessment and also if anybody in the audience wants to speak to the tax assessment issue, this would be the time to do so. I second it. All in favor? Okay, so uh, the agenda will be so amended. Um, before we begin, I'd like to welcome everybody uh, to the meeting today, and uh, thank you for your being flexible about uh, changes to the agenda. <laughs> we'll run the meeting uh, like a, a committee meeting. Uh, as they mentioned, we'll be building in time for public comment along the way. So the, uh, before we get into the, the agenda as originally outlined, um, there has been so much discussion in town over the, the reassessment and, uh, and the new tax tax uh, figures, um, we thought we would take time to try to update the group and the, and the public on um, current thinking and some possible next steps. So to that end, we're going to uh, kindly ask the town manager, Tom Hall, to, to help us with that. Sure. Uh, let me give you a quick overview. I think the first place I should start, um, and it's a reminder for myself, but for the councilors as well, uh, assessing is, uh, is specifically independent under state law. Assess assessors are, are independent beings under state law, and though the assessor works under my day-to-day -day supervision, interestingly, they're one of my the few employees that's actually appointed by council, so they really kind of sit in this uh, in-between land, and it's really important to know that, and I think it's, it's, it's that way for a very good reason. Uh, they are to be independent of political or administrative influence. The job's tough enough, frankly. Um, it could be even tougher through a reveal process, as we're currently witnessing. So let's just keep all of that uh, in, uh, in the forefront of our minds if we could. Um, we chose to use an independent um, uh, consultant to come in and assist us doing this residential reval. It was the same consultant that did the uh, commercial industrial reval last year. I think that has a value. Uh, again, kind of to my earlier point, they have no uh, allegiance to anyone. Uh, they're looking at this from an independent view and lens. Um, now, keep in mind, uh, this exercise took them through about 8,500 uh, properties in town in about eight months. And so that's uh, quite, a, quite a workload. Undoubtedly, through that process, things are missed. They're not able to gain access to all properties for one reason or another. And so the phase that we're in now is uh, hearings, face-to-face uh, uh, -face or in-person uh, hearings and reviews of the new tax cards and values. We're essentially midpoint of that. I think today was our sixth day. And they varied between five and, I guess, three uh, consultants on, on, um, on site here. And they're scheduling appointments every 15 minutes, and they've been booked, uh, you know, end to end. So we're really making uh, every effort to uh, grant a hearing and, and an opportunity for folks to learn more about the process and the final value. There are four more dates scheduled um, tomorrow, and I think Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday as well. So we're hopeful we'll, we'll be able to satisfy. We also have two days for phone-in um, discussions if people aren't able to be here on the scheduled days. So we're very hopeful to be able to grant an opportunity for anyone who really wants to, to learn more. Just anecdotally, having them here at Town Hall, we had the occasion of seeing people come and more importantly, see them go. Uh, Larissa's done a great job of uh, going out of her way to talk with folks as they're waiting or coming or going, and I think that helps as well. Um, from my perspective, uh, the, the discussions have been very congenial. They've been educational, informative. For our part, uh, we learn a lot. There certainly are errors on cards. Um, and that's part of what this is about, but it's also to educate folks on uh, the process and, and how, we, how they get to where they get. Um, as part of that, they also identify what I'll say is some trends. And there's a couple of uh, areas in town that are certainly deserving of a closer look, another look. Uh, those being the Hillcrest and Pinecrest uh, neighborhoods. Um, and I kind of combine those two because they're under common ownership. And the Higgins Beach neighborhood um, in general. And uh, there's been a lot of folks that have availed themselves of the opportunity to sit down and talk. And it's also an opportunity for staff to, to look more closely at the consultant's work. And all of this leads up to an opportunity to make final corrections before commitment. So. We're right on schedule that we've laid out. It's a tight one, but it's so we're right on schedule. Uh, I'm not in a position to mention what those adjustments will be, but I'm, I'm certain there will be, and, and I expect there will be downward adjustments. Um, it's really important for us to be able to 
justify and have an articulable rationale for what we're doing and why we're doing it. And that's exactly the process that we're undertaking. Uh, so bear with us. I think there'll be some good news coming uh, for those neighborhoods very shortly. Um, back to my earlier comments, perhaps the best thing for the Finance Committee to do is to perhaps talk about what you can do in this process. And I think there are a number of options. I've talked to a number of you and heard from residents that for some of us in, in the town who are seeing large increases uh, when the tax rate set and the final bill is understood, that they may not have planned on. And so it's caused many of us to think about, well, how, how can we help in that effort? Um, so uh, I've kind of mapped out a range of options that we can maybe work our way through. We'll take one by one. And there may be more. I'm not suggesting this is all inclusive. Um, you know, one option theoretically would be to simply delay the implementation for to the next commitment. And I guess there, there's a, a number of observations I would make. Uh, because we chose to do this process in two steps, commercial industrial last year and now residential this year, um, I can assure you we've heard a number of concerns and I think valid concerns from the commercial industrial taxpayers that uh, it's important to establish equity as soon as we can. And a further delay would, would uh, exacerbate that problem, arguably. And, and so it really flies counter to what we're trying to do, is to rebalance things. Um, in a perfect world, we would have done it all at once, frankly. Uh, I think we'd also potentially run into some concerns with main revenue service. Um, we've not, I've not posed the question specifically to them, but it strikes me that ignorance is bliss though we had a sense that we were lacking, uh, now we know. And I think it would be uh, very hard pressed to, to justify why we're delaying, frankly. So maybe I'll stop there and, and you can have some conversation or would you like me to kind of lay out the options and we can take drop back to Tom, the I'd ask you if you could go ahead and lay out the options okay. and then we'll come back around. Uh, okay, yeah. I agree. Um, another one is kind of a hybrid implementation. I, I think Councilor Hayes is the one that suggested and I've heard others express some interest. Uh, essentially, uh, I, as I understand it, and perhaps I'll let Peter speak to it himself, would be to potentially go forward with essentially two commitments. One, in the first half payment, it would be based on the existing old values, and then uh, have this, the, the second half payments applicable to the new values. Um, is that a fair characterization, Peter? Yeah, and I think what might... Yes, I think what might help, that was in part spurred by the question of, and, and what you didn't speak to, which might be helpful, we, we have a pretty short window of time before we can make any appropriate adjustments, because I, mean, I think now the window is 10 days out or... End of the month, uh, we're scheduled to set the tax rate. So, so the quite, that proposal was really based on, if we think we can have all the adjustments evaluated and set by that time frame, that's one thing, but if we really thought we were going to have to do some additional work, that would buy us the fall to do that work, hear people's concerns, address those concerns, and then implement it the second part of the year. So yes, that was that was sort of the basis for that I conversation. See. I'm reasonably comfortable, although there will be people that are still not pleased at the time of commitment, I suspect, mm -hmm. but we will have done as thorough a job as could be expected in terms of granting and receiving input, uh, dropping back and making changes where we see appropriate. So. I don't expect there's a need for delay from, from that point of view, that we need okay. more time. Um, having said that, I think there's still a concern about folks' ability to oh, that was a second put piece together second. the resources to, to meet those needs. Uh, the due date is set uh, was set by this council for October 15th for first half payment, so uh, that doesn't leave a lot of time for folks to put resources together. Um, and, and we kind of have kid for those of us that have seniors going off to college, <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of tuition bills that have come due. So I think uh, that's a novel idea. I think it could be challenging for a number of reasons. Uh, state law in Title 36 is very clear. Uh, it talks about an annual commitment. It doesn't um, at least leave the door open for multiple commitments. I think beyond that, there's some real practical administrative challenges that I haven't even been able to get my head wrapped around, frankly. And thirdly, I think it might serve to be more confusing to the taxpayers than, mm -hmm. than the current path we're on. So the last option I see, and this is one that I think is more some consideration, would be uh, fully within the authority of council, though you've already set the interest rate for, for delinquent or past due taxes, you could always modify that before uh, commitment. At this point, you set it for 9%. 
Um, certainly, it would be a gesture to the taxpayers uh, to get to allow them more time to pay that first half without penalty. Uh, so that's an option. It's worth noting. I think there's some um, some points just to to be aware of. Uh, to do so, you'd need to do it at your next council meeting on the 28th to stay on schedule, and that would require a waiver of the second reading which five councillors can do, it's within your authority. I think it's for good reason and I, I would hope if you wish to, that's, that's not an unreasonable request given the circumstance. Uh, there's also an ancillary impact uh, in state law, whatever interest we charge for delinquent taxes, to the extent that people overpay, we need to pay them back interest of a similar amount. Overpay if overassessed. Okay, so in, in the event that we need to uh, taxes or they overpay their taxes for one reason or another uh, right now we would pay them back 9% interest um, yeah we, pay them back, but we can't reduce it by more than 4% so it's at 5% however it's only for those who paid their taxes who were then finally over assessed if you right. just overpaid your taxes you just we don't pay anything Ruth, do you have a sense of how many folks follow that category on a consistent basis? Uh, so far, the only ones we've done it for are the folks within the uh, beach. That's for the property Six. tax uh, uh, appeals that are still ongoing with uh, the waterfront well, properties? However, if we reduce the interest rate, that re that interest, the amount we would pay them above that goes away. So they wouldn't get any. So I just want to make you aware that there's an impact there. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know that it's uh, something to terribly be concerned with. Uh, and the last one, there is potentially a, a cash flow issue for us uh, if savvy residential payers that had the resources or commercial industrial taxpayers who chose to use their keep their money and pay at the end uh, could potentially produce some cash flow challenges for us. Uh, we had a fiscal year starting July 1st. Uh, we really, uh, uh, this will be our first infusion of significant resources and that's Part of the reason why we need to stay on the schedule of getting the tax bills out is to get the tax revenue back to us. And we can't really predict how much that will occur. Uh, and I guess lastly, there could be a, a budgetary impact. We do have, uh, I think, a, a revenue that um, anticipates some level of uh, interest payments due to us. Ruth, do you know the size of that? Budget the budget for um, this coming fiscal year was is ninety seven thousand. <clears throat> that does include unpaid taxes, interest on unpaid taxes for the current year taxes, but it also includes prior year taxes for folks who haven't paid. Uh, my sense is that this would only, if, if we adjust the interest rate, it would only impact this year. This so year's taxes. Prior year's taxes would still. That would be my suggestion. You could even have that applicable only to the first half payment if you wish to kind of uh, narrow the. Uh, exposure to the town as well. So there's a range of options there. I think the budgetary impact, if we know what that is, uh, we can um, curtail elsewhere to make sure that we accommodate. Uh, we're early enough in the fiscal year that we can correct that sort of expected shortage in revenue. Um, I think that would be a, a very genuine and maybe a much welcomed gesture if, if some variation of relief on the interest uh, would be considered. So that's what I see as the, the range of options. Uh, again, there may be more, but those are the ones that have come to me and I've thought of. Uh, so you want to, we can stop there. I think one piece I'd like to touch on is kind of lessons learned and about how we maybe avoid some of these challenges going forward. Great. Let's we'll start talking about that. Great. Uh, I'd just like to pause here before we get into lessons learned and see if there's any comments or questions from, from uh, my fellow committee members. Yeah, I guess. Uh, Personally, I think um, I would agree that our best option would be the way I'm looking at it is two things. I think that we've identified two to three areas in town, and the staff is working pretty rigorously to um, if there's corrections to be made, which it looks like there are corrections to be made. I think those are going to be done relatively soon. <laughs> uh, so I don't see a ton of value in splitting it into half and half, for lack of a better term. I think. If I'm not mistaken, that, that would mean that three tax bills in a row would all have a different mill rate, possibly, for the residents. And um, I don't know if that's going to set us up for a communication uh, success. So um, from, from everything that I've um, absor absorbed for the last couple of days, 
I think waiving the, car the penalty or reducing the penalty, I should say, probably be our best bet. Um, and, and frankly, I even think that there'll be enough that develops by the end of this week, when Thursday, or well, maybe beginning of next week, yeah. that that might even adjust. And there, there, it's a strong possibility that we might that we might not even see the need. Uh, but I think uh, adjusting the current nine percent penalty should be absolutely on the table and something that we put on the agenda for the twenty eighth or to be considered. And um, if we put the put it on the agenda on the twenty eighth to be considered, and things have shaken out by then that that it, it's not necessarily, then we don't do it. But that's where I would be. So. Um, for me, just a quick question. So, Tom, you think the three areas you talked about will have the adjustments? If there's some things that lingers, or there's adjustments that are made later, what happens? So, that's that's the scenario you're talking about. That there's if it's later in the fall and that they go through, there's a formal appeal process right after this. Yeah, uh, just to be clear, when I mentioned those, I, really two areas, Pinecrest and Hillcrest, I'll consider them mm -hmm. together, uh, and then Higgins Beach. Those would be kind of global adjustments that would affect. Uh, yeah. the entire neighborhood, so to speak. Yeah. Having said that, there's all sorts of corrections and pickups that are occurring beyond that. So those are over and above or, or independent of other changes that we'll, uh, we'll be making because of better information through this process. Beyond that, after commitment, as in any year, every taxpayer is uh, able to file for an abatement of their taxes and go through that normal process. That's, that's always there, and we expect we'll have a brisk, brisk fall in that respect. Um, so nothing's different in that regard. We're just giving the folks um, an opportunity before we go to commitment to have a conversation and right. then changes are made. Mm -hmm. And if it happens after, sometime in the fall, after maybe they've already paid their, mm -hmm. you know, their bill, that gets adjusted is what we're saying, right? If, it, if, if the assessed value does go down, yep. with they'll, the get a partial, yep. they'll get a partial refund with the adjustment to the interest that we just talked about. Depending on what we set for an yep. interest rate. Yeah, yeah, okay. Ruth, do you know so, how? Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I'm done. What, what's our typical revenue on the nine percent late fee on property tax? Is that is that negligible or is that significant or? Um, last year, in total for the year plus the prior year unpaid were, uh, <clears throat> and that was at eight percent. It was yep. about one hundred nine thousand. And that's one hundred nine thousand extra revenue because of the fee, or that was just what was unpaid. No, that's the interest we earned. Okay, that, that is the interest. Okay, so one hundred nine thousand. You said. What we don't know is how much is applicable to the current year and how much to prior years. Yep. I, I would not be surprised if it's kind of an equal split. At this stage, because the interest rates in the past, they've only just recently started going up. The mm -hmm. state sets the rate that we can charge for unpaid taxes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, it was, it's 9% this year, it was 8% last year, I believe it was 7% a few years before that. Yeah. Okay. It was even lower than that. So. Yep. No, I was, gonna, I was just going to say through the chair that I, <clears throat> I, I, I concur with Councillor Johnson about putting the interest rate on the table. I don't know if we have other councillors here where they want to weigh in. That would be a good indication whether everybody's on the same page or not. So we, we can do that on that issue, or you can leave it open ended and uh, commit for us to come back with a broad view of everything. So yeah. I, how yeah. how would you prefer to do it? Uh, I want to make sure we leave time for Tom to do the lessons learned and learn yeah. that we also yeah. hear from the public. I guess I, I mean, I, right now I would, I would be in favor of committing to putting it on the agenda. <laughs> and we have, I believe, six of us in here, so we can get some input from the others as well. So okay. I think at this point with the load that we're facing, the more specific we can walk away from this committee meeting, the better. So. I agree. Yeah, I, I'll just chime in. I, I agree. I, I think it's a good thing to put on the agenda for the next meeting, and we'll know more when we get there. And the other idea that I haven't bounced off staff yet is, is there an adjustment we can make to the senior proper, property tax relief um, in, in that right now there's a 10-year residency requirement I, I believe where there's a lot of residents who are getting hit with this um, increased assessment that haven't been here for 10 years so I don't know if that's something that can be looked at between now and the, the next meeting. It would require an ordinance amendment and there's budget implications we fund yeah. the, uh, the expected uh, rebates if you will uh, as a budget line item. So could we get input from others? Yeah, other counselors who are present. So thanks for coming, by the way. Thanks. Yeah, I think Councillor Johnson's comments reflect my own view uh, that lowering it uh, uh, probably 
to some low point would be quite appropriate. Thanks. And just weigh in. Um, I would agree it's a good item to put on the agenda. I do have some other concerns, which I want to uh, do a little bit more investigation <laughs> first uh, around, you know, because the other thing that occurs to me is like, we've identified two problematic areas in town, but as a local real estate agent, I can tell you I've heard from many other pockets and neighborhoods where they feel like there's broad spread uh, issues as well. So I want to make sure that we're not paying particular attention to one area of town, particularly a beach community that I love and dearly, but as we all know over the years, always seems to get a certain amount of uh, attention and that can be um, a perception problem. So I just wanna make sure we're looking at the whole picture. Yeah, I, I, as of tonight, I'm just reporting what I know. Okay. Uh, that's not to say there aren't other areas under consideration that I'm not involved or aware of. Mm -hmm. um, so please don't misunderstand that. Right. Um, I think there was a, a deliberate, comprehensive review going on. These are just two that I'm acutely aware of. Right. So can I get a motion then that would summarize what we, the one or two items that we think are specific but leave open the possibility for um, adding other things as we just uncover them and are able to to make sure they're they're actionable and something we could vote on as a council. I'm no good at p motions, Peter. You got to <laughs> They confuse me. You gotta, I can second it. <laughs> I guess I'll make a motion that the Finance Committee recommends that on the 828 agenda that we include an item to discuss um, the relief of the interest rate and instruct staff to bring back a recommendation on what those interest rates should be. Okay. Second. Okay. And all in favor? Okay, so we'll do that. Great, thank you. Great, and Tom, we're eager to hear your lessons learned. Well, and also hear it's, from there's no great revelations here. Um, you know, we are almost 14 years from the last townwide reval. Uh, we did go to the voters uh, in year 10, which uh, arguably was probably even late in and of itself. We failed to get voter support to fund it, and uh, it took us four more years to find a way. Uh, and the only way we could do it was to do it in two steps, which uh, I think is not ideal either. So. Um, the obvious takeaway is that we should do it uh, more frequently, but there's a cost to that, and um, there's some aggravation associated with it as well. Um, I think there's other interim strategies that I really want to work more closely with staff uh, to make sure we have the resources, but there are many communities that do uh, kind of a quarter of the town mm -hmm. every year and kind of work, them, work through systematically on a, on a rotating basis. Uh, I can't sit here and say that we have staff capability of doing that uh, all in-house. Uh, there may, certainly we could hire consultants to help us on that frequency, but that sort of thing, giving more frequent attention to this, uh, would avoid these huge changes. And um, you know, most of the folks that I've been talking to, and myself included, although I, I have my appointment next Tuesday because I have some questions, um, don't really quibble with the, the final number. But it is a huge increase, and uh, and we can avoid that by doing it more frequently. Right. Larissa, do you have any thoughts yeah. in that regard? I think that one of the lessons that I've come away with is that um, I, I think that there is a place for consistent communication on an annual basis about how the relationship between the budget process and the assessing process, because some of the feedback I've gotten a lot from residents is this um, misunderstanding that the as the reassessments are somehow going to generate more money for the town. And I think that if there's if they're misunderstanding that, that there are other pieces about this really um, important part of their interaction with us, that there's also a chance to better inform on. And so instead of trying to get all of the information out about a, how a residential revaluation works, how assessing works, how property taxes work, only surrounding revaluation when people are already stressed out and, and feeling very um, emotional, that we could do a, a better job um, just making sure that that's kind of a consistent dialogue, teaching people about the, their government structures and, and the state statutes and what we are required to do and, and what we do do here in town, and that that would just have alleviated a lot of stress if, if um, we had made sure to have that conversation taking place well prior to this. I guess the last thing I'd say, in hindsight, I wish we had begun this conversation at the front end differently. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the adage typically in it, more times than not, it's true, a third go up, a third stay the same, a third uh, go down. Um, had we given some more forethought given the time between, uh, that simply wasn't the case here, given uh, the, 
passage of time and the, the, the massive increase in value. So um, I'm not saying would have changed the impact at the end, but we may have uh, lessened it or helped people, brought them along a little differently than uh, you know being surprised at the end because it didn't meet the expectation. Right. Okay. But can we just can we use this time just quickly to remind anyone that's kind of watching? Tom touched on it already, but I, one of the things that I've had in my conversations one-on-one -on -one with people that there seems to be a lot of relief surrounding when they hear it very clearly. The KRT meeting process is just the first kind of line of recourse. The tax bills are going to be printed and mailed September 15th is when they'll be sent out. As soon as those tax bills have gone out, people can then start the abatement process that, that Tom spoke of. And so I think that part of the, the fear is that when you get a letter from a government agency, very often you feel like your own agency, your own ability to, to act and to make changes is gone. And I, I think it's really important for people to hear, meet with KRT, have your questions answered, and trust that if it still does not reflect the true market value of your home, you have the abatement process to go through. And if you still don't agree with that answer that comes to the abatement process, you get to go to your, a board of your peers, the Board of Assessment Review, and have another process there. And if you're still unsatisfied, you have a state level process. And so just, I've, I've seen a lot of relief from people when they hear they have agency in this process. They, they're going to get a bill, and then they have steps that they can follow if they truly believe that that bill is an unjust reflection of the property value. Okay. Great. Uh, Larissa, I, I know the assessing department has a really easy to follow flow chart of everything that you just said. Can we make that front and center or perhaps post it on social media? Or, sure. Yeah, just Absolutely. it'd be a nice follow up to everything you just articulated. So. And, and I guess the request that Chair, maybe. You know, as, it, as the staff puts together their thoughts, they can come back at a future finance committee meeting and talk about if we are going to have a different procedure in the future, what that looks like, and we can bring that back as a, as a recommendation. Right. I, like, I like doing a quarter of the town more frequently and doing it with our staff that knows the community is worth exploring, I think. So yeah, we'd love to, have that, love to have that conversation. Yeah, and there's okay. a budgetary implication potentially, whether it's staff or consult, consultancy to help us do that on a more frequent basis with accuracy. And, and again, if, if, it's, if we use even an outside service, if it's predictable and repeatable, that's better than the one time that's been the problem, the one time mm -hmm. hit, the combined, but a reappraisal was 700,000 or something like that, right? 500, All 600? In. All in with commercial and? Uh, 500, 500 with, yeah. with software. Yeah, it's a, it's a big number. It's a big number. And we're gaining parcels every year, and this is built on a parcel basis, so it's not likely to get cheaper going forward. Great, thanks for that. So we'll wrap up this part on the the, the uh, reappraisal and the uh, the assessment, tax assessment. Public um, comment. Rebound. Pardon? Anybody public comment? Yeah, would you, and we'll yeah. take public comment now if anyone would like to speak on the topic of uh, the tax assessments and uh, the revaluation. Please approach the podium and uh, uh, if I may suggest uh, an AV tip, which I have not very many of. Um, you. <laughs> I think we have better luck with the handheld. Is that the way we're doing it now? You want me to use this? No, yeah. we can, you're good. We can, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. I have two questions. Number one, this firm that you hired to do this, the next time you do this, find people that have functioning gray matter to do the assessments. There is, I've spoken to so many people in Hillcrest who were told different things by different assessors. They seem to be totally unaware that we get virtually no services for our tax money. Um, I also spoke to somebody last night who met with KRT and KRT told them, oh yeah, we took the land into consideration. Supposedly that's not true. But every assessor, it, People who were going for these meetings are being told different things by different people. And they were told different things when the assessors came to their homes. And that's part of what's causing all this confusion because they can't get a straight answer out of it. You know, one person who works for KRT says one thing, another person says something else. A woman who lives across the street from me, when the assessor was outside her house, she asked her to come in. He said, no, we don't have to come in. That makes no sense. She was willing to let them. We were told we should let them in. The other question I have is 
the tax increases are never going to stop, no matter where you, what town you live in. There are other towns, Saco comes to mind, that allows their taxpayers to pay their taxes on a monthly basis, rather than getting slammed with this big bill twice a year. I'd like to know if that could be considered. I think it would also be nice if we could pay our taxes online. A lot of towns allow you, allow you to pay your taxes online. Um, I, I just, nobody has been able to explain to me how we can have this humongous increase in Hillcrest. We don't own the land. Our houses in normal times do not appreciate. They depreciate the same as a car. Ten years from now, a stick-built house in this town hopefully will be worth more money than it is today. Our houses aren't going to be worth more money than they are today. That's not going to happen. It never happens. If you go online and look at um, manufactured homes or mobile homes for sale around the state of Maine, based on the year they were manufactured, the values go like this, not like this. And we're being taxed like we live in Prout's Neck. It, it does, this makes absolutely no sense, and, I, and that's why people are so upset about this. 95% of the people, as I'm sure you're aware, are either on Social Security or on fixed incomes. You don't want to force people out of their homes. I, I don't think anybody here wants to see that happen, especially when they're senior citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, if you if you want to speak, please approach us to the podium. And if there are others who want to speak, if you give us an idea of who else might be following, that'd be, Donna, that'd be helpful. We had names. Okay, great. Oh, and uh, name and address, please. Yes, my name is Donna Ferry. I live at 543 DeFossis Avenue in Hillcrest. Thank you. Community. Um, I have about 30 years of municipal experience behind me, so I'm aware of what happened this year and, and how reval happens. Um, and the reason for it. And just to speak to one of uh, your points, uh, the town manager's point, um, we were mandated in Connecticut that we needed to do a reval every six years. It's quite costly. We did have to go outside to a firm. What we did was set it up as a capital project, put away a little money every year until we got to that sixth or seventh or eighth year. Um, it was a lot easier than trying to do it all in one budget. Sure. So that's how we got around that. Um, I was told before we moved into Hillcrest, uh, I stopped in to check on the taxes. And we were told at that time in the assessor's office uh, that they, the houses in Hillcrest were taxed as personal property. So it was a great deal. Um, I, I don't know who I spoke to because I didn't know I was going to be in this position. And um, nobody in the assessor's office recalls that. But when I had my interview this morning with the gentleman that performed this reval, um, he did say to me, the houses in Hillcrest were treated as outbuildings before, and that's how they were valued. And now they are being valued as every other house is in Scarborough based on sales. Now the people who just moved into Hillcrest in the past year and a half bought those houses based on the fact that these houses were being taxed as personal property or on the basis, the methodology of personal property, not on sales price. So I understand that different assessors have different ways of doing things none of which are illegal. But I think, um, especially working in a municipality, to keep the public trust, not only do you need to be open and forthcoming, but if you're going to make a major change, such as the methodology of pricing property, that needs to be discussed ahead of time. And not just, well, it was personal property, but next month it's gonna be real estate, and so it's going to double. Um, I think that's what a large part of the problem is, that 
everything changed and nobody was made aware of that ahead of time so there's something to be said about consistency and staying with the method that you've been using for the past fifteen years and not just changing it at the drop of a hat um, i thank you for what you do it's, it's not easy <laughs> and uh, hopefully this will all shake out thank you thank you, thank you. Ken, do you mind so I know we're trying to wrap this up because oh go yeah. yep absolutely thank you yeah name's Guy Bushy and my wife and I live at 603 Raylene and we're one of the people that just bought a home in Hillcrest uh, last July 16th so we've been there a year uh, we've yet to get a tax bill um, I was pretty appalled when we were looking at what the expectation is versus what we were told it was going to be. I remember sitting at the closing and asking about a deed and she said, no, you just get a bill of sale. So to me, a bill of sale is personal property, not like my home, which got a deed. And uh, I'm an electrician by trade. Uh, and in Article 550, uh, there's a separate section that deals with manufactured homes in mobile homes, and it says, uh, this is not verbatim, but it says uh, this code is applicable and that manufactured uh, homes are to be considered mobile homes. Mm -hmm. So there's a section in there and it tells you everything about uh, how to do the wiring and what the anticipation is. And I've wired many homes. I used to be a contractor in the 70s. Uh, and the bottom line is there's a whole other section for stick built homes versus manufactured homes. So um, the powers to be for the National Electrical Code, this is 217, are usually insurance companies, engineers, and those types of people because the concern is safety. So if they have a totally separate section for that, it tells me that you have a, a unique piece of property and that it's not really like a home. Um, and I know in my town, I bought my apartment building in Biddeford um, when I was 27, and I sold it last year when I was 67. We made a lot of improvements, and the market, having owned a home for, I had a beautiful apartment building on the Salco River, and so we made a substantial amount of money. But through the years, you saw how cyclical the market was and all the different evaluations. And I knew the appraiser in town, Mr. Gobiel, and he, they definitely uh, did the assessments uh, within a 10 year span. That was the last one. They had a lot of problems in my town and the, the um, assessors made the mistake because I was on the Slock River, but I wasn't where it was always high tide. I was exactly opposite Cow Island. And so they had a different number for that. And I always saw water, but kind of like in the front of my property was like the Scarborough marshes. So when I talked to them, they realized it was a company out of Massachusetts. They had made a huge error. And so they really corrected that error. And so um, it was wonderful. And I'm, I'm in anticipation and hoping uh, through your organization, uh, and thank you for this time, um, that you will make the corrections. Because like um, John said, uh, when I got this paperwork, I almost fell over backwards because I gave these people a, a, an awful lot of money to see what the real value was for the NADA report. But on the NADA report, it actually says 60 to 67 years max. That's all they expect that you're gonna get out of this home. So that was very surprising to me and very disappointing. Uh, so, but I'm 68, so you know, only God knows all that stuff. So uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, anyone else for public comment on um, the Reedsville and uh, tax assessment? Do you need my name and address? Because I didn't give it to you. Uh, like that. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure. I guess my, I just, to wrap it up, I, I do think I would like, if we could get an official response to, how, did we change the methodology on how we, we were actually assessing the Hillcrest community. I, I feel like people have asked the question. I'm not equipped to answer it, and I feel like I should be. So 
if there's a way to perhaps ask the town assessor to ha has it actually changed I, I think there's a lot of different perspectives right now and I think that it would be very helpful for, for everybody involved to have a clear objective response to has the methodology changed so. yeah I here okay. I would agree with that uh, I just want to add a, a comment or two especially as it relates to uh, uh, systemic issues you know there there apparently was a st systemic issue with these uh, several neighborhoods that were identified if there are other neighborhoods I want to make sure that they get included and the, and the work that we're doing also I in my own experience our own little spreadsheet exercise for a 15-minute meeting um, it's pretty clear to me I had some questions about methodology and also questions about execution you know how how good the execution was and so I want to make sure that we are also evaluating those aspects uh, of the appraisal work uh, as, a, as a group as a, as a staff and also, also as a town council so with that we're going to close this uh, this segment of the uh, you know of the agenda um, I, I did want to take a minute to try to return to the uh, to the main agenda we the intent of this is really for uh, for the finance committee to try to help us establish a framework for future discussions and analysis of uh, of any community center project you know if and when you know that occurs so um, we had really tried to we had aimed to try to do that three ways and this is really just kind of leading up to what will be a larger workshop a two-hour workshop on August 28th um, but we wanted to recap the work to date uh, on exploration of a sports facility and community center which could be located in the Downs development downtown area second we wanted to review some aspects of various alternatives and a uh, special thanks to John Cloutier who has done uh, a lot of work on this on his own initiative so we've invited him to join us uh, this evening and to run through uh, some of his work and some of his analysis now some of those include some modeling we went back and forth on this some financial modeling and then the one side said why model anything there's nothing to model and the other side said well we still need to understand some of the concepts so we went with the direction of let's try to understand the concepts and educate ourselves and the public about things like lease versus bonding and those kinds of ideas so that's really the intent of doing that um, after that we'll also talk a little bit about capital and what's in the queue uh, this is also for the purposes of updating and illustri illustrating to try to understand what may be in the pipeline so if you see numbers there like uh, placeholders for a new school and that sort of thing these are things that are completely um, very rough numbers so let's not you know get too excited about it we're really trying to focus on the concepts associated with these um, and I also uh, last but not least uh, I know that uh, Rocky Risperra and Peter Michaud are here our partners from the Downs Crossroads Holdings LLC so um, you know we look forward to to uh, involving them uh, in the in the workshop on the 28th and they're welcome to have an opportunity for comment during the public uh, discussion segment as well so thanks guys for coming and we appreciate you know all the work that you've done so with that uh, we're going to go talk a little bit about the chronology of you know what we've done so far yeah sure uh, unfortunately this is not on the slide deck but for those here and listening uh, the inception of this was November 2018 we signed a CEA agreement with the Downs partnership um, and within that CEA agreement there is a clause that says that um, we agree sometime in the future to um, enter into some sort of process in regards to two things a downtown area and a community a potential community center uh, the language I believe for the community center specifically says that um, crossings will hold uh, reserve land for a potential community center for the town of Scarborough uh, now fast forward till about until March uh, there's a group the edge sports group is um, planning for to come into the downs area and the edge sports group is very well versed in building many different sports facilities uh, they have done so pretty much throughout New England with lots of different types of partnerships. They've done them privately, they've done them publicly, they've done some sort of mismatch, mi mixed match between private and partnership, public partnership, excuse me. So it only made sense for us to at least do some sort of exploratory phase uh, to see if perhaps does the town of Scarborough fit within 
this Ed Sports Complex development. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll read off a little bit of, this is all available online in the agenda, but I'll read off a couple dates. Uh, essentially, March 19th, the Downs introduced potential partnership with the H Edge Sports Group. Uh, on March 25th, there was a telephone call with Brian, is it Davilis? Is that how you say it? Davilis of Edge. Uh, on April 8th, there was an article in the Portland Press Herald uh, where Peter, uh, Peter Hayes, and Katie Foley, and Tom all met uh, the Downs folks to review the press release. Uh, and then in May 24th, there is an uh, in person meeting with the Edge Sports Group for the first time, and that was Tom, Bill Donovan, and um, Todd Souza. And I actually think I was at that meeting as well. So Paul Johnson was at that meeting as well. Uh, from <laughs> I don't know if I was, I think I was. <laughs> uh, shortly after that, two weeks later, we toured their facility in Wellesley, which I believe their doors are open now. If not, they're going to be open very soon. Uh, and then f from there, essentially, I'm gonna fast forward so this doesn't get too lost. Uh, from there, it's the Edge Sports Group is coming, and it is coming to the downtown area of the Downs. Um, and so we've been approached to, at minimum, explore if uh, the town is interested in a partnership and what that might look like. Uh, the friction there is that this timeline has been a lot more accelerated than we expected. Uh, we had said as a council publicly several times that we were tasked with um, forming an ad hoc community center um, committee that would be made up of people of the town. Uh, so what we're doing today is to try to reconcile those two forces um, by just at least having a bird's eye view of what could it look like, what could this partnership look like, or what could it look like without the partnership. Um, the timeline of the edge coming into the downs really isn't dependent on the town. It is going to happen whether we're with them or not. Uh, so I think that's important to keep in mind as we go forward. Um, this is not something that we're necessarily holding up. It's something that we need to decide of if we're going to be a partner in this or not. Uh, the last last thing I would say is on August, I know it's been said, but it can't be said enough, on August 28th, we are having a very large uh, and long workshop on this uh, as an entire council. I have invited uh, members of the BOE, specifically members of the Long Range Planning Committee, uh, to sit at the table with us. I believe it's the superintendent as well. Uh, so I expect them to be there. And this was, because this is such an enormous project and it is something with such an accelerated timeline, we created this extra date as a way of priming the pump, so to speak, and hopefully we can make some sort of recommendation on what parts go to the 28th and what parts may perhaps don't, don't waste our time on the 28th, so to speak. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it back over to the chair. Thanks, thanks Paul, for the update on that. Um, at this point, I thought, it, are there any questions, any more comments on the chronology and the background here as we teed this up? No, but just to it kind of frame up the next part. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, part of that piece is, is because there are timelines that we're trying to meet. There was sort of a proposal that we took a look at, but then that really sort of brought up the question because as you reference the CEA, it does talk about land, but it does, it's not specific about do we purchase it, do we lease it, what do we do with it? So one of the proposals we had and what we thought might be helpful for the Finance Committee is try to just talk about what are the types of things we might want to consider and analyze as we go down the pathway, if we go down that pathway. And there are some real pros and cons and differences to, between maybe building and owning the structure versus leasing a structure. And so that, that was part of this, is just what are those differences? What do those numbers look like? What, whoever we do this going forward, what should we look at? which I think is where that's gonna tee up yeah. the next part of the conversation. And, and actually I'll just add, further add to that. It's important that this is not a, this is not a do or die, it's either happening or it's not. This is, this is an opportunity that's presented to the town and it's important that because it's an opportunity that we explore it. Uh, but this is not our one shot, in my opinion, this is not our, this is not our one shot for the community center, so. Yeah. Not now, either yeah. or, it could be an and opportunity or. So with that, I, I think we'll go ahead and uh, I'll try to drive here, John, but maybe if you could tee up uh, this, this segment on uh, trying to understand some of the concepts around various models associated with the, sports, the potential sports facility community center. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, you know, first, thanks for having me, um, inviting me to the meeting. I came on late in the timeline. I was elected in June, and I think this uh, particular meeting with our partners at the Downs was probably my second meeting as a councilor. <laughs> Um, but walking away from that meeting, I was excited at the potential for hockey, hockey rink coming to town and, and some of the other things that might go along with it. Um, 
but it was also something that was very different than what we were used to uh, looking at. It, you know, a lease, it, you know, partnering through a lease as opposed to bonding a project is something that we don't have a lot of experience with as a town. So I ran some cash flows on my own, and uh, as a result of some of that work, that's I, I believe why Councillor Hamill asked me to come. So to kind of tee this up, if you can go to the, the next slide, I'll, at its most basic level, there, there's a nuanced difference between a bond and a lease arrangement. With a bond, it's just like a mortgage. Uh, you um, collect money from somebody else and agree to pay it back over time with interest, typically <coughs> with interest. With a lease, it's more of a contract to use somebody else's land um, or facility for a period in return for a payment. So the, uh, that's really what I was trying to analyze the difference of uh, from the town's perspective. Is there a benefit to one or the other? And I, I don't think you can uh, say a lease is always better than a bond or a bond is always better than a lease. You, you need to look at the specifics for any individual contract or deal and, and make a determination based on its own merits. Um, some things that you want to think about or I think that we would want to think about is, is it important to us to own the asset as a town? Um, do we have constraints around issuing new debt? Uh, are we at our, our peak in terms of debt service or, or overall debt outstanding? Um, what's the tax impact? Now, typically, you know, for a private company, there's an advantage, a tax advantage to a lease arrangement. That's what drives a lot of that. But for a municipality, there typically would not be that same tax advantage. But what's unique about this situation with the downs is we have the credit enhancement arrangement where we share in the tax proceeds um, for the property that's developed there with the developers. So there is actually a tax impact to this lease agreement, uh, this type of lease agreement for the town. That, that's something that we should be considering. And then at the end of the day, you want to look at what it's going to cost the taxpayer. Um, you know, how much is this going to add incrementally to a tax bill uh, to do it or not? And if you can go to the next slide. Uh, there's a couple of reasons why I, I think we should evaluate this opportunity. And I, I know they're moving much, much faster than, than we are, so, uh, but they're here today, which I think is a positive sign uh, in that they're still willing to work through our processes. Uh, you know, in the credit enhancement agreement, there's some language where uh, the developer will reserve space for a downtown. Now, it doesn't say where that downtown is going to be. That's something that, you know, would have to be mutually agreed upon down the road. But they only have that obligation for five years. Um, and same thing with the community center within that downtown. It, you know, within the first five years uh, from the CAA agreement, they've agreed to reserve some space for a community center there. And then they's, they've also agreed to reserve space for a school. Somewhere is on the property. Um, but again, this is all just for five years. So the, the way I read uh, this, uh, that language in the agreement is there's a, a pretty big incentive for us to be partners, uh, both from the town's perspective and from the the developer's perspective. So that's a reason that I ran the cash flows and I thought it was worth looking at. Um, the other reason is they're doing the EDGE recreational facility and have specifically asked if we would like to partner with them or if we had the ability to partner with them. And then when you're looking at uh, the overall cost of a big project, if you have a recreational facility going in, um, if it's a similar use with a community center going right next door, there's some efficiencies of scale um, that go about by partnering in that type of arrangement. And then finally, timing. You know, I don't think any of us had on our radar uh, community center coming in the next year or two, um, but the Downs does for their recreational facility anyway. So um, there's a pretty big timing difference, I think, between what is possible now versus what might naturally play out if we um, go our own route. If you can go to the next uh, slide. So this, uh, you've done, uh, alluded to it at the beginning, uh, we debated whether to show any numbers because uh, unless you're looking at a specific deal, the numbers can be misleading, right? So what I'm trying to show with this slide and the next one is that the numbers can move somewhat drastically based upon the specifics of a contract. So the, the first arrangement that we looked at was uh, a lease arrangement um, where we would not own the property at the end. It was a monthly payment of $115,000 uh, per month that would escalate at 3% a year. Now, the NNN is a triple net arrangement where the, the leasee is, is responsible for a lot of the operating costs. Like can paying, you explain that acronym? For I the, can try. Yeah, so the property sure. taxes, for one, would be paid by the leasee, the, um, the utilities, and uh, basically all of the costs are 
somebody can correct me if I'm off here, but predominantly all of the costs of operating the facility would lie with the leasee um, as opposed to the, um, the leasor. Uh, some other things that it, you know, we would look at is when we sign some sort of lease, they're going to want a deposit before they start construction. So in this use case one, I assumed a $390,000 construction deposit. Um, there's uh, furniture and fixtures and equipment that go into a facility that the, um, would typically be the, the responsibility of the leasee to purchase. And based on some information from USA Swimming for uh, standard pools, I came up with an $800,000 estimate there for, uh, for this type of facility. And again, I'm going to stress that all of these numbers are fictitious and uh, very, very rough. Um, but they're what I was able to come up with in a short period of time. Uh, this particular scenario is similar to what uh, the Downs had presented to us in that it would include a, um, a competitive swimming pool, uh, a therapy pool with water slides, and a fitness area. Uh, so what I did was I came up with some operating assumptions uh, for revenue and expense. Uh, you know, you'd need this many staff to operate it. This is what they'd be paid. This is how many hours you'd be open a week. Uh, this is the types of services that you could offer at a very high level. And again, I have some experience with USA Swimming, so that's where a lot of these numbers came from. Um, I've subsequently met with um, Todd, our community services director, and, and he has a much uh, bigger purview or, or window into the, some of the potential revenue sources and expenses that might go into to all of this. But, um, so when you flow that through a cash flow model and, and you plug in a cost of capital, which for a municipality is pretty low, uh, this is what the present value of those future cash flows would look like. Uh, and in this particular use case one scenario, a bond uh, with a negative net present value of 5.2 million looks much more favorable than a lease arrangement of negative 52 million. Uh, when you skip over to use case two, very similar assumptions, except I reduce the, the monthly payment. Uh, that one now is $55,000 per month. It's a lease to own as opposed to a, a just an outright lease, still triple net. Um, I reduced the construction deposit, and I tweaked uh, the percentage of taxes due to this building that would go back to the developer. I said, you know what, that's kind of just a transfer. Why don't we just leave that out of the equation? They would still get 5% of the um, taxes due to the uh, credit enhancement agreement. And this is kind of your break-even scenario. So this is, uh, th this, based on these assumptions, um, a lease and bond look uh, roughly the same. Now the other uh, thing that we need to consider is do we really just want a pool, a fitness area, and water slides? You know, when we think of a community center, it's, it's more than that, uh, typically. And I, I, I know, at least in Todd Souza's mind, it was significantly more than that. So moving to use case three on the next slide, uh, and again, these numbers are, are just Fictitious. Obviously, it would cost more to build that type of facility, um, so the monthly rent would go up. Um, I, we should have a discussion about if it's important to own, and I don't know if now is the time, but if it's important to the town to own um, the facility or, or not. Um, it, there's pros and cons either way, but on a net present value basis, it makes a pretty big impact if you have ownership at some point. So, John, could we maybe pause there and just yeah. you know tell us based upon your modeling and and recognizing that each one of these scenarios has different assumptions. I mean, what are the, the two or three takeaways for us on these? Would two you say? or three takeaways. If, and again, the only, I believe the only thing they're looking from, uh, for from us at this point is a timeline for how we might be able to evaluate if a partnership makes sense. So if you go to the next slide, I, I lay out some of the items that I would consider important to be able to make that determination. Thanks. And one of them is for us to collectively determine what we want to have inside that community center. And I, I know that community services has done a lot of legwork leg on that, but I think that needs to be socialized and vetted. And um, once you have that, what should go in, then you can start to run some numbers on it. You know, are there funding sources or, or that can come with each of those? Um, what are the revenue expense assumptions that would go along with including a senior center or child care or um, a gymnasium. Uh, and then you can produce an income statement. And I think a five-year income statement for the town-managed portion of this facility would be helpful. Um, 
I mentioned engaging SEGO to assist with the economic impact, and I, I want to clarify that. It's not a full-blown economic analysis. It's more, we, we've gone, I think, I've seen it stated a couple different places that we would expect this to be a catalyst for development in the downs. And I think that there's benefit to the town that could come from that and benefit to the developer. But I'd like to validate that. What, are there examples of um, other areas uh, of the country or, or the region where a community, a recreational facility like this has spurred development? Um, and, and that can just, help, I think, help uh, directionally with any decision that might be made. Um, and then you go, then you iterate. So I, we talked about forming a committee. I know that there's some um, feelers out there for anybody that might be interested, but I, I think these are the types of things that you would bounce off that committee is, is, okay, well, if I add a gymnasium with pickleball and a basketball court, it's gonna cost an extra 10 million, but I can generate these revenue streams. And you go through all those options and some things you say, yeah, it makes sense. Others might not make sense. And at the end of the day, I think that committee would come back with a recommendation for um, what components seem to make sense to include. And then you can look at the funding. Um, so I, I kind of just jumped. <laughs> we, we started with the end, with, with the numbers. It's, it, we threw some numbers there. But really, until you define what you want in a community center, and, and if it's just a pool and what the downs propose, then we can probably make a determination pretty quickly. But if it's more than that, then I think we need to go through somewhat of a process. And I, I don't think I have much on the next slide. These were just, I mentioned, yep. the, you know, how, how do you socialize this and, and engage the public? And then the, the other item for the Finance Committee, from my perspective, is we don't have guidelines around the town entering into a lease agreement um, of this size or scale, and that might be something that's worth pulling together. Great. John, thanks, thanks very much for teeing this up and covering all that material uh, in the fashion that you did. It was helpful. And if there are any questions at this point from, uh, from my fellow committee people. Uh. Uh, John, could you just speak real quick? And I, again, I know these are for demonstrative purposes only, but the lease to own options? Yeah. Are there certain assumptions of a purchase price at the end of that when, when you were doing your modeling, or? Uh, I mean, the assumption is at the end of the lease we take we ownership. We owned it. Yeah, so okay. it'd be like a dollar. So the, okay, so the assumption is transfer of ownership yeah. at the end of the lease. Okay. Yeah, there, there's a lot of assumptions in there that uh, may or may not hold, but those are the ones that I, yep. that, that's what I went with. That makes perfect yeah. sense. Thank you. Yeah, again, just to summarize, for me, this was less about the specific numbers but more maybe just a recommendation from the Finance Committee to however, I mean, the, the sh workshop we've referenced on the 28th is going to get into a lot more. What are we going to do? What is it? What does it look like? How do we get there? But I think our recommendation, or, or I don't know if it's appropriate for motions, is just to say when we get to the numbers part, we should just make sure we look at all of these options as, and I think, Tom, you've said it best, we need to do what's in the best financial interests of the town, and that should include looking at owning, looking at leasing, whatever it is, but we just need to make sure we have that sort of full spectrum of analysis to, to figure out what's the best financial arrangement for the town. Or there may be other considerations, as, as you have suggested, that we may want to do something different, but it should at least be part of the, part of the process. Mm -hmm. Because it's clear, as I understand it, the, it's not specific in the CEA whether it has to be a lease or has to be one or the other. It's, it feels like that's a discussion and negotiation. Yeah, and there, there's a lot of moving parts with this partnership <coughs> that uh, they might be able to entice us that, but won't cost that much, and there might be some yep. things that we can do that won't cost us much but would have great benefit to them. So yep. uh, there, there, there's a lot there that, um, you know, there's a lot of potential there uh, to have a discussion and, and see if something could work. Right. So I guess my, I mean, my first reaction, and we've had this conversation individually a lot of times, but we're kind of stuck in this chicken egg loop here where very clearly the first thing we need to do is identify key components and services. <laughs> so in how process. are we going to do that? When are we going to do that? And because without doing that, then we're all just in the dark, so to speak, right? We're, we're maybe one step above what John just gave us. So I guess, I mean, my... Uh, I would love to have some sort of path forward to identify key components and services. Obviously, that's an ex that it might be an a little more accelerated than what we thought, right? But you know, is there a way to balance 
respectful to the process and respectful to the community and, and, and to do what we said we were going to do and to concurrently keep the option open with the community center, I don't know if that's possible. But, I mean, to me, we can't get off go until we've identified the key components of the services. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And again, I think my understanding was, is that is the purpose of the lengthy workshop you right. talked about, right. is to talk about next steps. What is the process? What's the public input process? How are we going to get to that design and what we're doing? Right. I think that was, and again, at the end, I think we'll outline a little bit about what we're trying to accomplish with that workshop. But so I think the 28th, we were trying to come out of that workshop with much more clarity around what is it and how do we get there? And yep. If that makes any sense. I mean, are you suggesting we do something different tonight to try to, to get more clear? No, I mean, of course, this is this is something the whole council should workshop on. Yeah. I'm just, I, I, we're, you know, if we, if we have three scenarios sitting in front of us on their face, clearly we don't want to enter into a, you know, option number one, it doesn't have a whole lot of merit, financial merit right now, right? So, you know, I, I guess, <laughs> I think we, if we're looking to get these numbers to be refined, or better yet, task Todd Souza to actually come up with models that are, I, I think John's probably, for what he's done, he's probably in a pretty decent ballpark for discussion purposes and illustrative purposes. But, you know, do I suggest that we bat around case one, case two, and case three at, at the 28th? No, I don't no, think no, that's gonna no. be very useful, no. right? I think it's good for us and it's good to see, for the public to see, okay, this is, these are some possibilities that we're going down. But if we're looking at a, a recommendation to really try to focus on the 28th, to me, it, it's not those. It's not discussing those three. No, no. Okay. I, I think. Yeah. I think, as I understand the 28th, it's really more of your question about how do we define what it is we want. Is it is right. it is it Todd defining what it is for the community, or does the community need to participate? And I think the big question on the table is, is it a pool or not a pool? I mean, that makes a huge difference in in the cost structure. So. You know, I don't think we have information. So I, I think yeah, that's that, I that's the purpose is yeah. is how do we accelerate, if appropriate, the process, and what is it? What does it look like? And then we can define maybe some milestones along the way of where do we want to be. Yep. Side question, Loris, has there been any interest since you've started to promote the committees? Has Absolutely. any? There has. Yep. Can you give us some rough idea? Forty. Oh, great! Wow, that's impressive. Forty-two. Terrific. Wow. Forty-two right. people are responding. Uh, wow. <laughs> All right. All right. That's nice to know. Um, but I think that one of the things I just want to be really just quick on the sure. notes, that has gone out. I, I want us to be really, especially something like a community center, there are some groups of, of people within the town that we very infrequently hear from and, and see, but that we might anticipate would be really big users of the community center. I think we need to make sure that we're doing a, a sure. purposeful yeah. outreach. Right. But it hasn't been crickets. You've had oh, some. Oh, no, okay. absolutely not. Okay. okay. Would, depending on the charge for that committee, I think we should be very thoughtful. Uh, in terms of selecting folks on that committee to be able to do the work that needs to yep. get done. Yep. Um, you know, Paul didn't mention, but following our trip to Wellesley, Todd and I had those same very questions. Uh, you know, what does it look like for us? Right. Wellesley wasn't for Scarborough. That was very clear to us. And so uh, a big reason, one of the many reasons Todd was hired is uh, he ran, he built one of these and ran one of these. And so he arranged tours for us so we could go see them in operation and get a first-hand sense of what are the parts and pieces that make sense and work and make money? And, and with that, uh, we've started to formulate, uh, really to really advance our knowledge, um, what are the uh, critical elements? And for our purposes, we did assume a pool was uh, a, an absolute requirement, given some of the feedback we've heard anecdotally through the community. And we're acutely aware that we need to attend to senior needs. Not exactly sure what that means yet, but that's a need I think that, that must be addressed somehow in a facility. Beyond that, there's a bunch of parts and pieces that uh, can fit in, and a lot of it has to do with uh, community desire and and, uh, and the ability to generate revenue, frankly. Right. Just to add to that, it, it, being the a numbers guy, I it, I was on the tour of, of the you know, different facilities, and uh, the question I asked was, what's your operating, operating deficit? And w we toured three very different facilities with different quality of programming and services. But almost every one of them had a deficit of three to $400,000 um, annually. So some, some of them would raise that through taxes. Others would raise that through an annual fund if there are why. Um, so that's kind of a ballpark number in my head. That doesn't include the cost that they bond, you know, of what they spent to build the building. But that's a, right. yeah. that's a guide for other facilities in Maine. Right. 
So I, I think we've kind of framed the problem statement pretty well. I mean, we are possibly going to be in a position where we have to respond quickly as a, you know, as a committee and as a town to an offer uh, uh, and, and make a decision on that. The, the problem I have with that or the challenge is I think that we need to do that and we also need to engage the public. We've got 40 people that want to sign on and participate with this. We've got a commitment that, uh, you know, CEA commitment to set up processes by year five and, and Rocky said all along this is going to need to happen sooner than later and, and it would be great to be able to, you know, get those things going at the same time. So I just want to make sure in our process of vetting something that's right in front of us that we don't foreclose opportunities to really take uh, a broad view of the thing. Uh, including other uh, other ownership structures that we may not have contemplated so far. So. so I'm about to restate what you just said, but I do think the charge of the committee shouldn't be centered around this specific, I mean, it, this specific opportunity is huge and it, and it needs to be explored, but the committee should be charged with exploring option one, two, three, and four, so to speak. You know, if I, so I'm gonna, no. if, I had a, if I had my way after the 28th, I feel like as a council, we're dealing with this a little too much. I want a committee to take this over. Right. Like go away, right. take this over, and let's figure out what's going on. Right. Um, because I don't, we're not equipped as a body, either as us three or us seven or 14, if we're going to throw in the BOE. Yeah. We need a committee. Yeah. I would love to be able to have, come out of the 28th and have one party say, you know what, we'll give you six months to breathe. Another party to say, hey, we'll step on the accelerator. If we can meet somewhere in the middle, and then I think that that might be a, a, some sort of um, common ground there. Yeah. Okay. But I think that our partners who are in the back, I think they need to, they need to also have somehow give up. We get, we're a little bit in the dark, right? We don't really have, we know that it's opening. We know that ideally they'd want us to be signed on as a tenant tomorrow, as they should want us to sign on to a tenant as a tenant tomorrow. But I think we, both sides need to have some sort of clear understanding. Sounds like we have the interest, which means we could probably get a little bit better of a timeline than we expected, but we're going to need to be met in the middle from our partners. Yep. If I could, I think there's plenty of opportunity to have, and, and the committee should explore the full range of options that mm -hmm. ought to be mm -hmm. clearly within their mandate. I think the key is to keep this option alive to some extent so we can evaluate and make a determination when we're ready, right. is to provide some level of timeline to that process, and hopefully the timeline is not... Um, so out of whack with what theirs is that uh, the option right. you know, it, it simply goes away because of that. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's probably a way to find find that happy point. So do you have a, a frame, well maybe we close this segment with a frame of what the uh, 20th might look like or a suggestion of that, uh, and maybe walk through an outline and then we can vet that or so, you know, amend and improve as appropriate running up to that date. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the thought of it was it, sort of just as we discussed, really kind of, it's a two-hour workshop, maybe spend the first 15 minutes just updating. I, I think Councillor Donovan and Councillor Johnson were volunteered or volunteered. I'm not yep. quite sure which. I'll have a visual aid this time. So. <laughs> just, just a quick update of the journey, with what we've done, how we've gotten there, where we are. Um, then I think the next piece would really be to talk to our partners and really explain a little bit about EDGE and what it looks like and what they're thinking about and, and what that looks like. Um, and then kind of pivot to sharing some of the information we do have. We certainly did a, in the comprehensive plan. We did do a survey about a community center with some questions that probably leave as many questions unanswered as answered. But it, was, it, it didn't ask about whether it's a pool or not a pool or all those types of things, pickleball court or not. Um, I think those are things that a group needs to do. But anyway, at least review, and then I had an internship that went out and did poll a lot of the community centers around the state with some information about what worked, what didn't work, some of what their structures are, those types of things. Um, and then maybe pivot to talk, and I think, Tom, we had talked about a model in this community that did work is the public safety building, where we really brought people from all walks of life, including the expertise we needed. They actually list that they brought in the, the, you know, the fire chief and the police chief and listened to their teams about what they needed. They designed a building and an architecture or structure. They got bids on it. They saw through the whole process. It was a long process, so we may not want that long. But talk a little bit about what may have worked or didn't work in that process. Um, then get a little bit of public input, just as people have heard what we've talked about. Do they have anything? Then we'll pivot to the second hour 
which is really trying to build consensus among all the council members about what do we do? How do we get there? And as Tom had suggested, I think, Tom, you were thinking about maybe some draft directives to the to the ad hoc committee about what their mission might be, or I, I don't know, if, or no. we can try to come up with that. Mm -hmm. But the process was try to walk out of that night with, at least with a blueprint of how we're going to move forward. What yep. were we going to do? How are we going to do it? Try to put some time frames around that that can be you know responsive to the to the pressures we're talking about. But that was the thought. Yeah, I'm sold. Okay. Yep. Yep. So, so I, can I actually, Mr. Uh, for Peter, Mr. Chair of the Council, are we are we going to actually create this committee on the twenty eighth? I don't. I, I, that wasn't the intent. I think okay. we we had, I, we had talked about you know talking about if we are going to have the committee, what does it okay. look like? Then I think we're going to try to quickly pivot and talk about how we would get the committee up and running. Okay. And I think Tom, when we did it, it was what you pick some pick some names or it was, we kind of came up with the community and then we're thinking the next meeting in September we could form. Okay. Do you form. do you create and appoint at the same meeting or does it, it might be difficult but I think we could certainly create the committee if there's proper direction given on the 28th I think we could turn it around uh, at your next September 4 meeting to actually appoint appoint, so appoint the committee right so to, I mean well, I mean I, I guess the creation would be largely symbolic but perhaps that might be worth it. I don't know I wouldn't characterize this symbolic. I think it's really important to be thoughtful in particular about what you want this committee to do. Okay. And okay. that, in turn, will, uh, I think, uh, again, you should be equally thoughtful about who you put on it to make sure yep. that they can carry out that charge yep. successfully. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Great. So that was a thought. Just yep. to try to try to really get some clarity and a blueprint and a pathway. For the directives of the committee. Yep. yep. And yep. a pathway forward to try to, to, to answer the questions that we have from our partners and to also answer some of the community questions. Yeah, so in a nutshell, I think if that second hour of council deliberation could really focus on kind of process and timeline. Yep. Yep. Is that fair? Great. Yeah. Yep. Process and then timeline. Yep. Yeah. And directives. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So at this point, I want to make sure we have enough time, Tom, for you to run through a quick look at capital, uh, and then we'll uh, allow we'll time. Do it on my account, Don. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, but I think it is. I think it's really critical because I think what you're going to show us is we have a. a financial cliff coming our way um, that we need to plan for. It's more of a cliff we have to climb rather than one way we're going over. So. Did you want any public comment? Anybody want public comment? Yeah, you have any public comment? At the end. I thought we'd do it all at the end. We'd have them go through the Capitol and then have public comment at the end, if that's okay? Or you want to, now, you want to talk now? Well, let's get... I, I, <laughs> Uh, I, I, what we just talked about. I mean, what? No. Yeah, go ahead. Go. Yeah. go now while he's setting up. Go ahead. You, you want to have a comment on? No, I think the, the, the oh. should have the yeah, we will do public comment at the end after we do the, the capital discussion, if that's okay. So um, I was asked, to, and I must give all the credit to Larissa, because she really did a lot of it in coordination with her financial advisor, and I, I know Ruth was involved as well as some of the senior staff. We were asked to uh, look at some of uh, the expected future capital needs and try to get a sense of uh, layer them in in terms of timing and cost. And I must preface all of these uh, conversations that follow uh, with caution because there's, uh, as Councillor Cloutier mentioned, there's a ton of assumptions built into here. So we're doing the best we can in terms of when these needs will come, come on and, uh, and then we've modeled what the potential effect is. Uh, Larissa, do you want to speak further? So um, you had in your pocket, and it's also available online for anyone that wants to look at it, this sheet right here that showed, you, this may look familiar, it's an update from the 2017 facilities study that this was presented to the Finance Committee um, a couple years ago now. Um, you'll notice that some of the items shifted. So um, also this includes large equipment purchases like fire trucks because those are things that would go out to referendum for people to vote on. But some of the things that shifted, um, we are hearing from our colleagues at the BOE that a school building, which was not on the 2017 plan in this timeline, is needing to be on there. So I've put in a pre-K through three school at $60 million um, to go before the voters in November of 2020. Um, the, uh, there's been a delay in the fire station expansions that were on that original 2017 um, 
program, and that's at the advice of the fire chief who wants to get into the new public safety building, get a sense of, of what may have changed there, so those have been pushed out. So you'll see um, there are things that we know are coming to the voters this fall, the high school track and turf and the fire engine that will be in front of them, the public library next fall, the pre-K-3 school as a real possibility for 2020. Those are the big ones. Um, and we've taken off a couple of the smaller projects that were on that 2017 study. Improvements to the town hall and SEDCO have been removed. I think that there was um, a real understanding that there may be little public appetite for those sort of projects at this point. So when you are looking at the graph in front of you that I understand looks a little bit intimidating, um, that is with the understanding that everything that's in front of you has been approved by voters. Also though, as a caveat, that does not include any additional debt that council approves through their budget process. No. Okay, so this is just adding to our existing debt that's held with these um, voted on finance projects. It does not include that two, four, six million, depending on the year that council may choose to put on this as additional fund. So a couple quick questions. What's the value of that gap then from the second bar to the third one? Just about 75 million. 75 million. I mean, basically, our debt outstanding principal in 19 goes from 95 million to 2021, 178 million. Okay. That's a big, it's a significant jump. That's with no CIP budget. That is with no additional bonding by right. council for budget. Yeah. And do we have a number on what that average is, like past five years or so? Is that all? Of I would out of uh, no, but I would say to you that it would be between four and six. All right. Thanks. Which I realize is five, but I don't feel comfortable giving you that specific <laughs> number. Now that four and six arguably would include some of the items on here. Right. So I, I, I would say it's probably closer to, I won't even hazard a guess, but we can make an attempt at modeling that piece too. But I think this graph probably makes the point that wanted to be made tonight, that right. we've got some well, big costs coming and there's huge impact. And maybe go to the next one, which is a debt service, which, it, which does impact the budget. Right, so when you look at the debt service fees, if you go to the next slide, Councilor Hamilton. So um, you see that. Nope, go back one. So this nope. is starting in 2021. Um, and you see that debt service coming on full scale from a, a, a school project is really what you're seeing there with that debt service um, breaking that $20 million mark. Comes down fairly quickly, um, but it's still a, a significant increase from where we have historically been in the 11 to $12 million level with our debt service annually. And, and from a budget perspective, what it means is that year as we go from 21 to 22, that is a $8 million increase in debt service, which is about 10% hit to the tax rate. So that that's what we got. It will depend on the timing of the school. But that's just something for us to think about. If we're trying to have level tax rates, how are we going to absorb something like that? And so that, that feeds into the timing of some of the projects we are talking about and thinking about. In, in this conversation, as a result of the community center conversation, which I, I think it is, um, Councillor Hayes mentioned it, but it has to be financially attractive to us uh, to move forward now in some sort of hybrid partnership. Uh, there has to be, uh, that's, that answer has to be affirmative before you go any further. We've talked tonight, and we'll talk further on the 28th about what sort of information we need to make that determination. Is it the financial right answer for us? And, and I think that's why, when we set the capital budget, that's why the community center was out in time when you see those curves starting to go back down, is where we could better absorb. I should say, the community center is not even on this list right. for yeah. purposes right. of right. We pulled hoping that <laughs> Yes, <laughs> yes. So. so the reality is, uh, if we were to go it alone, that's likely, in my opinion, eight or ten years out or longer. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so that's, there's a consequence, uh, perhaps, of, of that delay. But, but, but the difference between, I mean, yeah, we wouldn't have the debt service from the bond, but we'd still have an operating cost from the lease for the community center. So the cost will still be in the budget, which is, which it, is it may be the right thing to do, but it just, we need. Whether it's leased or owned, I, you know, we believe that we could probably cover two thirds or better of the cost through fees that it, it generates itself. So it's not a, a, an entire impact to the tax rate, uh, but there's there's potentially uh, certainly some exposure that needs to be covered somehow. So, and John, when you mentioned 
the three to four hundred thousand a year. That that's separate of financing the building, correct? Those weren't lease payments. Those were. That's correct. Okay. So they, all those all those buildings were bonded at some point. Either bonded or they raised funds for okay. them, yeah. one way or another. Yeah. yeah. So so when we if if I know this is getting a little gross, but if we were to add a lease payment on top of that, it'd be four to five hundred thousand, so to speak. It it would be more than that, but. Yep. Like I said, I, 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 Todd has some pretty compelling uh, arguments for how we could legitimately help to cover some of the, the expenses. So I think that okay. would need to be looked at. But the lease payment would be more than a it, couple hundred thousand dollars. Peter, I, did, did we slot some time for Todd to actually give a little more Scarborough-specific presentation? Or do we think that's getting too far ahead of ourselves on the, what we mean? On the 28th? 28th. I, I, mean, just, I haven't a, seen any work by Todd. So, I mean, if work, Todd has some work... We began that and we we hit the pause button and we can okay. pick that back up. Um, but I think that would the starting point for the conversation would be decidedly different. And, and maybe that's just the, the fact of the timeline that we're now on. Okay. We start the committee, the public process. Uh, uh, we can validate and test some of the work we've done to date, as opposed to starting at grassroots to establish and identify all the amenities. Um, we're fairly far along in our thinking, and I think it's fairly. Um, rational thinking that uh, that conversation can start much further down, down the street. Or maybe we'll let Todd give the presentation to the new committee in the first meeting. Well, I mean, it, I mean, two answers to your question. One, what Todd did come up with is part of the packet and the information. So certainly when we I think talk... A, is there a little more than what? Or is it just a square footage analysis? Or Well, he had, I think he had services. Anyway, oh, okay. so okay. maybe the thought would be, to answer your question, yep. in the piece when, when, you know, that we're going to talk about EDGE. Yep. Yep. Todd could have a piece of that and right. say, this is what he envisioned. Yes, I would like that. That's what I was okay. trying to articulate. Yep. 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 We can do that. Okay. Um, Public comment. Yeah, I think at this point, thanks uh, very much for the capital update. And uh, sorry to shoehorn that in like that. I know it's worthy of a much longer conversation. I know you went through a lot of hoops to, to get stuff together. So thanks for that, uh, Marissa. And at this point, there's uh, time for public comment here at the end. Uh, Sorry to kind of squeeze it into uh, you know five or ten minutes, but uh, anyone else who would like to comment uh, is welcome to please approach the podium. So, Peter Mitchell with uh, Crossroads Holding. Can you hear me, all right? Okay. John, thank you for putting that together. Uh, that work that was appreciated. Thanks for your consideration. So, we we have three or four key things. Um, from our point of view for you folks. One is, you know, we want to make it clear we do want to support the public process. Um, we recognize its importance uh, and we recognize, uh, you know, that that needs to take place. Our issue is, you know, you could see where this conversation started from a timeline point of view. <clears throat> and we did in that chronological report, we did provide a suggested timeline that we were working on, that we were trying to collaborate with, with you folks on, uh, on May 2nd. And I can see how that got missed now because John wasn't here. So, uh, but that was provided. Uh, I just want to make that real clear. Uh, and so we're not on that schedule, so we're on a new schedule, but we need one. We, we run businesses and we're accountable to, to our partnerships and uh, accountable to our, uh, our corporation. So, um, we do need to arrive at a timeline. And quite frankly, having that would really drive everything for us in terms of how we want to do this and, and when we want to do this. Um, so that's critical for us. The other piece is we agree that the services that are needed are critical um, for um, whether you folks decide, and you know, looking at the debt service of the town and everything, uh, I think Tom mentioned it, it's pretty obvious that um, some sort of lease arrangement or something would, might be, you know, the most, the best viable uh, choice. Um, but I would think that looking at our five-year commitment, which we will uphold with our CEA for the rights for the, for the town, it's very clear that the school is going to take precedent. I would consider you guys to be just thinking um, around the, the, the thought process of take a bird in the hand rather than two in the bush. If we can provide some services, especially on the senior side and the pool side, and maybe the hockey rink, there are revenues that can be generated from that. So the cost isn't all born on the town. I would tell you that what we know is there's typically a, a delta. John, you mentioned three or four hundred k a year. I think that's right. 
Um, I think that's right, and uh, we don't we don't have necessarily uh, P and Ls and facts on that, but that seems accurate um, or within reason. But there's also um, we recognize that there is uh, membership uh, revenue generations that can cover that. So I think you know the town may have a, a period of time where they've got to uh, uh, we've got to cover um, startup costs, but beyond that, it very well could be a uh, a, a revenue generator for the town. So. So we need a timeline. Um, I recognize and appreciate what you folks are saying on the 28th, but that would be critical for us. Um, and, and the other thing, we would consider a lease to own deal. That's not off the table. That's whatever makes the most sense for us, it makes the most sense for you folks collaboratively, and we can deliver the services to the town uh, under the theory that we got a burden in hand here. And with the debt service and so on that we see in the ceilings that we have, I don't think a community center is realistic in five years. Um, my own personal observation, that's nothing these folks are, are saying or, or anybody else, but just a little bit of reality. So, But thanks again for putting it together and thanks for taking the time. We will support the public process. We just need some timelines. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. And if I can just, Peter's absolutely correct. He, the, I mean, it was essentially pu published in the Portland Press Herald, the timeline. I mean, so this is more a function, I think, of us going abruptly from fact-finding to reality. So I, I, I do think that the timeline was apparent to us. I don't think perhaps we took it seriously enough uh, because we were more in our, I think, although we knew it was a year away or what have you, we were in the five-year mode. And so I, I did want to just publicly say, Peter, you're correct. I, it, it was, you've been pretty clear all along this was happening very soon. So. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. You're very welcome, sir. Now, you donate that land for the school, and then we can actually have a real conversation. <laughs> he didn't run on transparency, this guy. So. <laughs> Any other public comment? Thanks, thanks again, Peter, for that. Yeah, thank you. Right. And we look forward to you having more time uh, when we get together again on the 28th of August. So. Um, any other comments or questions? At this point, uh, I want to thank everybody for their flexibility and turning on a dime uh, to pull things together and to follow through and execute the meeting today. So thanks for that. Thanks for sticking with us, everybody. And I know this happens at a particularly busy time with all the, the tax work going on. So so much for a quiet summer. <laughs> uh, but uh, at this point, do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Uh, all in favor. Good night, everybody. Nice job.